Hello everyone, Adrian from Audio Excellence. Um, today I'm very privileged and, and excited to have Peter McGrath from uh, Wilson Audio joining me in this a very quick short interview. Uh, Peter has been very, very kind to uh, uh, come all the way from Florida to meet with our clients to demonstrate uh, the XVX and the Alexia V. So let me tell you very quickly about who Peter is. Um, Peter is the chief muckety-muck in charge of causing the most amount of trouble at Wilson Audio. Stop it. Get some help. Um, he's actually uh, an incredible recording engineer, uh, highest order, but also probably the uh, most notable, the worst punster in the world. I've spent a whole day yesterday with him, and every few minutes he comes up with these zingers, and I want to kill myself. Emotional, damn it! Anyway, everybody, uh, Peter McGrath, how are you doing, Peter? I'm doing fine. Great. Uh, I'll refrain from punishing you further. <laughs> <Is> he, okay. <laughs> punishing, pun. Okay. Anyway, I don't know how he comes up with it. So um, let's start with a couple of um, uh, things. Um, we're here specifically to demonstrate the XVXs. When I got the XVXs, this was during the lockdown, and so of course we couldn't actually demonstrate them to our clients. And then when uh, the lockdown was lifted, we got so busy and then the room was in a turmoil, we never did in fact get a chance. So this will be almost officially our first proper demonstration to uh, our, our wonderful clients, and Peter, we're delighted that Peter's here to be able to do so. So Peter, um, uh, maybe in a very uh, brief uh, way, talk a bit about uh, the XVXs and and why they are so special. It's it's a it's a powerful question and it demands a, a reasonably good answer and I'll try to do that. Um, basically, the XVX is a distillation of as many virtues as possible of what was Dave Wilson's last creation, the Wham loudspeaker. And um, what, uh, with Dave's passing and with the existence of the WAM, which remains a tribute to the genius of David Wilson, what Daryl wanted to do was uh, take as much as he possibly could from the WAM and distill it down into a speaker that had a number of virtues that the WAM did not. Not the least of which is that the XCX is a good foot shorter than the WAM. And one of the problems we experienced with the WAM was that in a lot of rooms, it was simply too tall. Um, and uh, also, of course, the price of the WAM was for many people, no matter how aspirational they were in the world of audio, it was beyond the reach of many. And so what Daryl really wanted to do was to be able to develop a speaker that drew on as many facets as possible of what the WAM could do, i.e., the uh, micrometer adjustment, the veneer adjustment of the module separate to each other so that we could get the time domain down to a millionth of a second, which you could do on the WAM. Uh, he wanted to retain those characteristics. He wanted to also bring maybe some new technology that had developed at Wilson and we had access to that didn't exist at the time that the WAM was created. So really the, the, the idea behind developing <coughs> The XVX was is to make the highest possible level of technology. It's a flagship for mm. us at this point. It is our production flagship. The WAM still remains, and there are that we, you know, it was it was from the get go a limited production product. Uh, we haven't sold them out, so if there's anybody out there that aspires to acquiring a WAM, there's still a, a, there's still a, their access to them is still open. Um, mm. But the uh, XVX really does take many of the things that uh, Dave developed and Daryl learned and then implemented in a loudspeaker design. And a speaker that is less than half the price of the web, a good foot shorter, but really comes up to many of the best aspects of the web's performance. And uh, it's, it's an extraordinary loudspeaker. And we've had, as you said, we, we introduced it some time ago. We've, we've We've had an incredible amount of success with that loudspeaker worldwide. Uh, hundreds of pairs sold at, mm. at this point. Right. Let's jump back a little bit just for context. Sure. Um, fans of Wilson Audio, or at least fans of audio as an industry who have been around long enough and have experienced uh, David Wilson's 
designs over the years, uh, many have um, made the remark that the not only have the products continually evolved, obviously the sound has as well. In your uh, opinion, uh, educated opinion, how do you describe the how how the involvement has um, has has progressed? Especially now, it, it's gone from what David did uh, uh, um, at the head, and what now Daryl is doing. That's a good question, and I'll, I'll say this: is that that the the goals that we are achieving have not changed. I.e., the company was founded on the premise by David that the purpose of a loudspeaker design that he would develop would be to, as most faithfully as possible, reproduce a recording. And given the access that he had then to the driver technology, the capacitor technology, the materials technologies, and all of these things, it required that he come to a certain point. And, and I would agree with you that, that there's been a significant change over the years in terms of what the end result is, but the goal has always been the same. So when Dave was chasing that dragon back then, uh, he had access to various tweeter technologies, he had access to various mid-range and base technologies, capacitors, material technologies, and he utilizes what was the best available to achieve his specific goals. And I would wager that if you took the original Watt Puppy and compared it to anything else of that era and played it and used accuracy of reproducing a recording, it would still be at the top of the heap. But of course, over the years, technology has evolved. And, and uh, it was in fact, uh, you know, we made the transition from the titanium inverted dome tweeter and the focal to the soft dome tweeter that we're using now in virtually all of our loudspeaker designs. Well, that came about long before David's passing. That was something that they embraced because he finally found a tweeter technology that would retain the transient, the dynamic capability of, the, of what he used before, but that had the added benefit of changing the actual texture of the sound in a direction that everyone agrees is more pleasant mm. and equally accurate. So those are, that's kind of how things have evolved. It's really access to better things, better materials, better alternatives that he didn't have back in the day when the company started. But the goals have not changed. You know, really the whole idea behind any design that Dave did and which Daryl continues today to this day is to as accurately as possible reproduce a recording. Excellent. Um, I have a question here from one of our viewers. Um, every manufacturer chooses a list of priorities when designing. Could you give us an idea of the hierarchy of priori priorities that Wilson Audio values and why? For example, David Wilson wrote a book called Dynamic Contrast and Harmonic Expression. What is harmonic expression? Gosh, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think that it's Dave's term for essentially musical satisfaction when listening to well-recorded recording through a loudspeaker. Um, harmonic expression means that essentially that there's clarity, there's transparency, that the harmonic elements of the sound are not being intermodulated, that they're coming through as the musical sound entered the microphone. That pretty much is what I, that's how I would interpret what he means by harmonic expression. That's certainly what it means to me. And that is clearly evident in, in our designs, whether you're listening to a, a Sabrina or an XVX, harmonic expression is very prevalent, i.e. there's no blurring. Again, the speaker can only reproduce the recording. And if the recording has all kinds of technical flaws or issues or uh, phase distortions or whatever, or over EQ'd, the speaker can't fix that. And it's, it's one of the reasons why I got involved in, in recording many, many years ago was to understand that. And, and that's what also Dave got involved. You know, right. his, as recording engineers, we, we get a sense of what goes into the microphone and that raises our level of expectation of what comes out of a loudspeaker. Well, that ties in really neatly to another question that we got in from one of our uh, viewers. David 
Wilson used his own recordings, among others, as a reference while designing speakers, ostensibly because he knew what they sounded like, and so he could work towards recreating the sound. How does Daryl design, i.e. what's his North Star? That's a good question, and I don't know. I, but I, I, my suspicion is this, because I'm not present with uh, Daryl when, when he's doing those designs. I was in many occasions back in the past with Dave, and my assumption is that Daryl's methodology is no different than what his father's was. But what I do know is that from the time that Daryl was about five or six, he accompanied his father on many of the recording sessions that, that are still used as reference quality recordings today for the evaluation of voicing loudspeakers. Also, interestingly, Daryl's musical taste as far as I know, and I, in fact, I'm, I'm confident that it is, is far more Catholic than his dad's was. Um, uh, Dave and I are old sticks in the mud. Our, our life is classical music. That's really, that was our passion and remains our passion. I mean, both of us would foray a bit into jazz and into folk and into some degree of popular music, but our passion really was, was acoustical, uh, classical music Daryl's is so as well, but he's a lot more Catholic. He listens to a lot more contemporary music, representative of people of his age and generation. So my guess is that a lot of his voicing is influenced by the realities of those kinds of music today. To what extent that influences the direction he takes in terms of voicing, I don't know, but I can't imagine that it's not a component of what he does. Mm. Um, is that a good thing? In my, in my opinion, absolutely a good thing. Um, and uh, it, it makes, it, I don't know to what extent, it, it, at the end of the day though, I know that Daryl's philosophy is the same as his father's, which if we get getting back to this mantra, that the speaker should only reproduce the recording that's being fed into it. It should not add to or take away or embellish in any way, the quality of that sound. Mm -hmm. One of the unique features that uh, David Wilson pioneered is the ability to time align the modules. Um, indeed, I'm personally not aware of any other speaker that allows for such amount of time alignment precision. Um, some speakers try to do that by sloping the baffle of the front of the speakers. Some have a curve but I'm not aware of any speaker, and I could be wrong, but I'm not aware of any that allows you to independently adjust each module with such precision and with graphs that are uh, um, based around your ear height and the distance from the speaker and so on. Um, so the question is, how important is this amount of accuracy? You talked earlier about the, the fact that the XVX and the WAMs are, are precise to millions of a second. And what is the sonic result? In other words, just because you can achieve this time alignment accuracy, do we actually hear it? I'm playing the devil's advocate in asking this question. Yeah, there's, there's, no, well, Dave has maintained this for decades. Mm -hmm. But in recent years, there's now have been a whole bunch of scientific studies that have been done both in Stanford and I believe at Cornell. I'm not sure of that institu which institution, but there are now published papers that talk about the sensitivity of the human brain ability to discern time. And what's kind of interesting is, and this is particularly interesting to me in my advanced age, is that as we get older, our, our hearing sensitivity drops off at the high frequencies slightly or significantly, depending on how much damage we've done to our ears in our lifetime. Um, but what doesn't diminish in time as we get older is the ability to discern time. That's a whole different neurological function of the, of the ear function, where it can actually differentiate dif whether you're 75 or 15. That functionality in the brain remains essentially the same. And we are very, very sensitive to the shift in the time domain of the harmonic structure. So there's, uh, there's a lot to support that now that didn't even exist. It was, it was in Dave's mind, a theory, and it was validated as time went on. And uh, it's, it's uh, why other, other manufacturers don't embrace it as readily as we do, I don't know. I can't speak to what their design uh, parameters are, but it has always been something that has been critical. And it gets back to that concept of harmonic resolution. And it's, it's to be able to keep everything in line 
in much the same way as the microphone actually captured it in the first place. Mm. Wilson Audio was a very early pioneer in using very rigid materials for its speaker enclosures, uh, and then, of course, subsequently developing its own, such as the S, X, and now the V material. What is the sonic benefit of these materials? In other words, why use um, these kinds of materials? What's so important about using these as opposed to what the vast majority of speaker manufacturers use, which is MDF or HDF? And how does that? How does it compare to um, aluminum or carbon fiber? Well, uh, all of this began with Dave uh, in conjunction with uh, uh, Brigham Young University, which uh, our factory is practically next to their campus in, in Provo. And uh, in their research and, and development materials de department, Dave started a study with them back in the mid 90s, where he examined a whole slew of different materials from different kinds of MDF, different kinds of hardwoods, concrete, back then early forms of carbon, uh, aluminum, steel, all kinds of things. We do these experiments. And what it really came down to was is that no one material is uh, totally non-resonant. But what he did come to the conclusion was he was looking for essentially a solution that would work. And we found that there wasn't one that worked over the entire band. And so he started uh, investigating things that the term he used back then was monotonic. Uh, mon meaning that, that when, when you'd excite a resonance in a material, it would have as, as little as possibly even one resonant mode. That was the start of the X material is that it wasn't non-resonant, but it had one resonant mode. And he said that if you can attack one devil, it's better to try to attack 20 devils. Because if you look at a, as a resonant mode of MDF, even the highest grade MDF, it's multiple. Uh, and that gets in the way of that harmonic resolution type thing. So that's when we started really getting serious about it. We did look at aluminum. We did look at carbon. We did look at various hardwoods. And we came to the conclusion back then that X material was best for a very wide range, but that there were perhaps other materials that might be better suited for certain frequencies. And that's why we came up with the M material, which we start using now on the baffle of some of our designs. Then uh, after Dave's passing, the development continued on with Daryl, and uh, we came across yet another substance that we referred to as V material. And that is something that is utterly dead in terms of absorbing resonances that are transmitted from one plane to another. So we now use V material strategically in our designs to essentially isolate modules from each other. Uh, for example, on our new uh, Alexia V, uh, the V material is the top slab on the top of the woofer module and then on the bottom. And we now are even using V material in our isolation uh, pods that go on the bottom of the speaker. It's yet another technology, and we won't stop there. I mean, we'll continue developing this as we go on. Mm. At the end of 2018, Wilson started making its own capacitors. Many competitors use boutique and expensive brands like Mundorf. How do Wilson's own capacitors compare? What is the benefit of making your own? Complete control. Mm. And, you know, for example, here's what you find in uh, capacitive development. Most capacitors are built at best tolerances to maybe three, four, six, eight, ten percent tolerances. We're now capable of building our capacitors down to 0.1 percent tolerance. Wow. And that's incredible. Plus, we are ex free to explore whatever materials we want and the windings in any way we want. And we're taking this to a whole nother level. We've already expressed it in, in all of our current speakers, but we're taking it to another level. We're about to introduce another speaker that has yet another level of capacitors that have heretofore has not existed in any of our designs. And we've made a, a, a huge investment in these capacitor machines and in the technology. First, we absorb an existing company. We brought that into our own factory, and we've now taken that, and we're really expanding on that and specifically as it focuses on what our needs are in developing and, and, and uh, uh, optimizing crossover designs. Um, plus, we continue to offer our capacitors as OEM products to other uh, high-end manufacturers and even the military that are using our capacitors. Let's discuss um, one of the things that very few speaker manufacturers 
have uh, procedurized, and that's the Wilson Audio setup. Um, I first uh, came across this when I was helping David Wilson set up a pair of whams, and I was fascinated by what he was doing. And as a budding engineer at the time, I couldn't reconcile what he was trying to teach me with what my professors had inculcated in me, which is yeah. basically that the professor said that every room has standing waves and basically there's no perfect room and so you try to locate your speakers where there's the least amount of excitation and you sit where you get the best possible results and so on. And then I meet with David and David comes in and he says, okay, this is what we do. You sit on the chair, I'm going to read from the book and you're going to hear my voice and there's a point where suddenly my voice gets very clear and it's still a bit phasey and then as I keep walking, suddenly my voice sounds like I'm talking outside in the outdoors. And then as I continue to talk, suddenly it starts sounding phasey again. So the point where it starts sounding very clear versus the point where it starts sounding phasey again is where we want to uh, uh, mark off the floor and that's our zone of neutrality. I thought, this doesn't make any sense whatsoever based on the, the stuff that I've been reading and, and been taught. Um, but so he set up the whams and it, there's no question, it sounded absolutely amazing. Fast forward, personally became a dealer, owned a whole bunch of Wilsons, and of course was trained to do this process. And as I've, over the years, uh, uh, toyed with all these different uh, setup protocols from different manufacturers, I keep coming back to the Wilson setup because number one, it consistently works for me. Uh, number two, it's repeatable. Uh, in other words, it, it doesn't so much matter whether the room is rectangular, or an L shape and so on, I can consistently get very, very good results. Um, and number three, what's also very fascinating is that oftentimes the speakers don't have to be six, seven, eight feet from the wall behind the speakers, whereas a lot of other protocols almost necessitate that you have the speakers a third or more into the room. Correct, yes. So uh, um, all of that is a preamble to now uh, um, talking a little bit more, more about the veracity of the, uh, of the process. Um, we're in uh, our new uh, renovated room. Uh, when, when Peter um, and I set up the date that he would come and visit, I said to my architect friend, we gotta get this room done because up until then, the room was a big mess. We were using it to- Can I thank you enough for what you've achieved? Oh, this absolutely. My, utterly magnificent. My pleasure. Um, um, we were using the room actually as a staging room because it was the only room big enough so that I could bring in all the stuff that we would have to bring to do an install. And so we would bring it in here, test everything, make sure it all worked, then pack it back up and then load it on the truck. So the room had become uh, uh, useless and meanwhile, my, my beautiful XVXs were sitting in here, lonely, unplayed. So when, when Peter said, I'm coming, I said, we've got to get our ass in gear, get this room done. And then, of course, once the room was done, I started doing the Wilson setup. And, and uh, uh, over a period of a few days, finally got it to where I was pretty happy with it. Uh, as always, there is no perfect room. And I was looking forward to see what Peter would do. I left the marks on the floor and I didn't say anything else to Peter, as Peter will tell you. Peter said, is this where you ended up? I said, yes. And I said, Peter, please, let's see what you can do. You've done it way more than I have. So I was the main pusher and puller of the speakers. And Peter- <laughs> I'm an old man, I don't do that anymore. <laughs> Peter sat there very comfortably with a glass- Pasha, Pasha-like. With, with a glass of gin <laughs> no. and said, Adrian, uh, push the speaker back another inch. And I would do that. Uh, another one, and I would do that. Um, let's move the port from the front to the back. He made me work for my dinner that night. Oh my God. For about two hours, basically. Uh, um, actually, much less, but within the two hours, we had accomplished so much, it was unbelievable. One eternity later. If I feel uh, courageous, I will have uh, Mike take a picture of, of what he ended up with. Uh, uh, Wilson Audio produces a sheet. Um, uh, of, what do you call the sheet again? Well, it's just a graph. It, right. What it is, is it's, it's, it's our trail. In yes. other words, we, we, we move and you mark and you document every spot you're at yeah. and you grade each individual spot. And by doing that, you can find the optimum spot and go beyond it, but then be able to come back to that optimum spot. I, I, I liken it to leaving 
like leaving breadcrumbs in the floor so you know where to go back to when you found the best place. Yeah, it's, it's in, that, in that sense, it's much more objective than thinking exactly. that it sounds better and then you move in and you're not really sure, whereas this way, you know. Yep. Anyway, the reason I say if I'm courageous is because in both his and my graphs, I write curse words when I when I, when I have a set that is setting that's terrible. I write curse words, and then uh, Peter has his own uh, code words as well. So anyway, depending on how we feel, I might uh, I just have them take a picture of it. What's fascinating is that where Peter ended up again with with all, literally no input from me sonically. Right. Other than moving it, Peter says, I think that's it. And then we both looked down and looked at the measurements, and we were a quarter of an inch from each other. A quarter of an inch. But that quarter of an inch was sonically yes. very significant. Right. But the point is, this room is about 19 feet wide right. by 24 feet long by literally 20, 20 feet tall. And so in terms of variations of where the speakers could be, it's enormous. It's right. literally enormous, and yet we both ended up within a quarter of an inch uh, of each other's setting. <laughs> so all of this preamble is to come to a point that Peter made yesterday to me about the importance of working with uh, a trained Wilson audio dealer when buying Wilson speakers. Uh, this almost sounds self-serving. It really isn't. No. Um, any, any of you who know me know that my first priorities have always been to you, my client. And I call you clients because of that. As opposed to customers, a client to me is more than just a transaction. It's exactly. somebody that I care about, yeah. that, that I look after. And so uh, when you buy something that's a high-performance speaker, you want to make sure that, of course, it is uh, uh, optimized as much as possible within the realities of your room and, 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 and your lifestyle and so on. Peter, why don't you uh, get uh, uh, tell uh, the viewers what you said to me about the importance of this? Very, I'd uh, love to start with an anecdote first. So that is, is it my friend Mike K. You refer to clients as a, as a, uh, my friend Mike K. Used to refer to them as patients. Because <laughs> <laughs> he his whole process was psychology. Yeah. And, he, and he said he said. Either I, I recommend they go sit down on the couch for two hours, or they work with me. <laughs> anyway, but uh, getting back to it, what you're saying is absolutely correct. My basic mantra, and Wilson's basic mantra has always been, we put an immense amount of work into the creation of our products. Every detail is sought through. Um, down to the austenitic stainless steel screws, there's incredible passion that goes behind it. And there's a commensurate high price that goes with it. But at the end of the day, all that work, all that effort is only as good as the guy that sets them up. And if that setup is not done optimally by someone who really knows what they're doing, there's a very good chance that all those efforts have not been fulfilled to their potential. And that's really what we come down to. And that's why we emphasize this. And what you're saying, Adrian, is absolutely true. And, and there's so many people who don't understand that, who buy a Wilson speaker, maybe used or from second hand, or, or, or maybe uh, less than scrupulous transactions take place and they don't get the full benefit of a competent, proper setup by a dealer, which we have trained. Then they're not getting the full Wilson experience, irrespective of how much they did or didn't pay for the product. Now, so that, that's really critical. And I'm utterly delighted that, that we were able to come pretty much to the same place. Yeah. And that's a mark of, uh, of your competence and your, and your guys' competence in doing what they do. Uh, kudos to you and to them. That's, that's exceptionally, exceptionally good and, Thank you. And, and necessary in our industry. Well, to, to me, the, the bigger point was not that we were that close, although it shocked me that we were. Um, the, the point was that it, the, the process is so repeatable and so iterative that we could in fact get to be that close. But the other thing that's also interesting is that if you follow the Wilson setup procedure, and let's say you don't know anything else and you haven't been trained, and you just watch David, oh, by the way, for those of you who want to get an idea of how this works, you can go to um, uh, Wilson Audio's uh, YouTube channel and search for David Wilson talking about this process. Um, uh, I had forgotten how incredibly uh, Erudite, is that the right word? Yes, no. That it was, David, it was that David was. Yeah. He, he, he's able to capture and describe in a few words 
how very, very clearly what he's thinking about. And uh, if you were just to watch that video and just take notes <clears throat> and then try it in your own room and see what happens. All you have to do is try it. Um, I think you might be amazed at how well the system will work. Let's uh, uh, cover two more last things that has to do more with you, Peter, personally. Um, I'm fascinated because you've been doing this for so long. Um, what are some of the uh, early uh, speakers in electronics that had an impact on you that to this day you think either very fondly of or uh, um, you, you don't have fond memories, but they're great memories? I have one, very, very two uh, uh, situations. The first really was as a child. Uh, I guess I might have been 12 or 13 years of age. I grew up in South America, the Republic of Panama. And my father and mother had a pretty advanced stereo system for the era. And it was a, uh, it was a Tonoi, 15 inch monitor, dual concentric Minoy, Tonoi with a custom made enclosure. And they had a quad valve mono amp and a quad uh, pre-amplifier and a Thorin's turntable. And I remember listening to uh, opera. I remember listening to monaural uh, orchestral recordings and uh, also Frank Sinatra recordings. Uh. Fly me to the moon. Let me play up there with those stars. Um, things of that ilk at that age. And uh, later, uh, my father was gifted a, a Magnavox console, which I remember back then, while it was technically far more advanced, because it was actually stereo, um, it didn't sound anything like the other system. And so I recognized right away that newer is not necessarily better, that there's something about fidelity that is more important that can, forgive the expression, that can trump technical <laughs> advances. Um, the second experience that really, when I was in graduate school years later, I was interviewing with a guy at a high-end audio store in Chicago, and I vividly remember that uh, he was describing to me his store. This is way before high-end shops really existed. A gentleman by the name of David Shooks, who shall forever remain one of the chief influences in my mind. David was talking to me about they sold this, they had this, he was importing this product, that product, and so forth. And, uh, uh, and while he was talking, all I could hear was someone playing the cello in another room. And finally I said, with all due respect, Mr. Shooks, please, can I, can I go into the other, I wanna see what's going on in there. And so I went into the other room and lo and behold was a pair of quad 57s, mm -hmm. a turntable uh, playing uh, a saraban from one of the box suites run a cup at each cello by uh, uh, Pierre Fournier. And I sat down in the chair and I realized that this is magic. This is magic. This is something that I had, you know, I knew what hi-fi was, but I had no idea, you know, and, and it brought me back to the experience of the Tsunoi that I'd had more than a decade before, that this was visceral, it was magic, and uh, I, I made a decision that that's something that I want to find a way to devote my life to. That's great. And the last question, aside from Wilson Audio Speakers, you travel so much doing training, doing uh, presentations and so on. Um, you've heard so much out there. Aside from Wilson Audio Speakers, whose other um, creations do you enjoy and admire? Well, uh, I, in terms of uh, certainly, uh, uh, I, I make no secret of the fact that I adore what uh, Dan D'Agostino does. Um, I, I'm a big follower of the D'Agostino electronics. Um, I'm a big fan of transparent cables. Uh, the cables are a complicated thing, and at the end of the day, uh, I just find that they give me music. And not only do I like them for what I do in terms of listening, but I also use them throughout my recording chain. I have for as long as I've been recording. Um, I also like, uh, I'm not a big fan of turntables, only simply because to me, I don't have the time to be involved with it. And uh, um, I can go into a lot of political reasons <laughs> issues with turntables, but, but the reality is, is that uh, uh, 
you know, there, there, there are a lot of components and it's just, you know, ultimately I'll tell you what it really comes down to. It, it's not so much product that I encounter when I'm traveling. More often than not, I'll encounter a setup, which can consist of products that heretofore I didn't have much respect for, but I hear in the context of a setup combined with other elements together in a room where I'm blown away. Mm. And that really is it. it. It's hard to really isolate, you know, a specific brand or product. It's usually a synergistic assemblage of things involving both the room, the knowledge of the person, and frankly, oftentimes, the choice of material that is played that I have the opportunity to hear. Um, one of the big issues that I've got, for example, with hi-fi shows is that uh, significant judgments are made, but you walk into a room and, and the music being played could be utter crap. <laughs> you know, and, and, how, and, and yet judgments are being made yeah. based on these sorts of things. So it, it's, it's, it's odd. It's complicated. For sure. One last thing, Peter. Look right at the camera. Yeah. And in your best Donald Trump uh, <laughs> uh, um, mimicry, say, Audio Excellence is the best, man. <laughs> Subscribe to this channel. Yeah, <laughs> and I can't. I can't do it. No, but, uh, uh, no, but what, what you've done, Adrian, not just in terms of uh, proselytizing your industry and your business, but you've done a really great job for all of audio and, and, and that... Um, You've got a, a group of uh, followers that I think are not just informed about your business, but I think are well informed about choices and how to go about making things. And, and what I really respect is that, uh, that they're imbued with integrity and sincerity, which, uh, which is critically important. Um, there are uh, a lot of things happening in social media and on websites and um, they're, they're uh, their self-serving aspects are equal to their ignorance. If that may, you understand what I'm yes. saying? I mean, they're, they're, they're incredibly stupid things that are going on out there. And, and thank God you're not one of them. Uh, and and uh, now I'm, I'm an older guy. I'm not from the generation that is as much adhered to that as, as people that are following in my generation. But the reality is, is that... Uh, um, I've enjoyed what you, you have done and continue to enjoy it. And, thank uh, you. I hope I keep that level, <laughs> not bring it down. Well, yeah, you know, thank you very much for that. I appreciate it. And of course, if my kids were here, they would be horrified. They'd tell you to your face. They, they, they to this day, are embarrassed that their father is a YouTuber. <laughs> yeah. yeah well, uh, anyway, well, thank you so much for joining us. And again, I can't wait to see. Uh, the faces and, and the reactions of our clients who are coming this afternoon uh, to visit with Peter and, and to have Peter do his presentations and so on. And for those of you, unfortunately, who can't join us, um, hopefully we can give you a little bit of taste. Uh, we're going to be uh, um, recording the sessions and, and see what we can get out of it. And, and uh, if everything goes well, we'll be able to publish it as well. So till next time, thank you for watching. Adrian from Audio Excellence, Peter McGrath from Wilson Audio. We'll see you. Bye-bye. Thank you.